We're obviously here in the sentencing for the State versus Richard Alexander Murdoch. Uh, Your Honor, I have prepared the uh, sentencing sheets uh, signed up. If I can uh, hand those up to the clerk. Uh, Your Honor, uh, very quickly, uh, the defendant has no prior record, uh, and the state has no uh, um, victim impact people who want to speak at this time. Uh, but I will address the court briefly. And I don't need uh, Your Honor to repeat the evidence uh, that Your Honor just heard for the past six weeks, uh, but it is overwhelming, and it shows this man to be a cunning manipulator a man who placed himself above all others, including his family. Uh, a man who violated the trust of so many, including his friends, his family, his partners, his profession, but most of all, Maggie and Paul. This is a very complicated situation, and I, I want to offer my condolences to the family that has suffered here. Uh, we have tried very hard to be respectful and sensitive regardless of what position any person took, uh, because this family has suffered and they've had to suffer in the public eye. And I want to offer my condolences to this family. I want to offer it for Maggie and Paul and Mr. Randolph too, who I had the pleasure of working with on one occasion. But the reality remains is that despite all this attention, this case is about Maggie Murdoch and Paul Murdoch, and I'm so thankful that the jurors gave them a voice. You heard about Paul, obviously there was the vote case, but you also heard him described as a fun-loving young man, a person who loved life, a person who would do anything for his friends, for anyone. And he's cut down as he was just starting to live his life. You heard about Maggie. You heard how sweet she was. You heard that she was a girl's girl who adapted to the outdoorsman life of her sons, how much she loved her sister and her brother-in-law and their children, and she was cut down in the prime of her life. Both of them, like everyone else, was unaware of who he really was. No one who thought they knew this man no one who thought they were close to this man knew who he really was. And, Your Honor, that's chilling. And I've looked in his eyes, and he liked to stare me down as he would walk by me during this trial. And I could see the real Alex Murdoch when he looked at me. The depravity, the callousness, the selfishness of these crimes are stunning. The lack of remorse and the effortless way in which he lies, including here sitting right over there in this witness stand. Your Honor, a man like that, a man like this man, should never be allowed to be among free law abiding citizens again. And I would submit to you that the only just sentence here to give justice for Maggie and Paul is the maximum, and that would be two consecutive life sentences. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, you indicate that uh, no one, no victim would like to speak at this time. Uh, would any victim like to speak at any time during these proceedings? Your Honor, one of the things we did, and we did early on, uh, obviously, as I just said, it's a very complicated situation, but we made the decision early on. We've had our victim advocate here who's been doing a wonderful job, regardless of the viewpoints of any individual family member, to provide aid and service to them, and we made that decision. Uh, I'm informed by our victim advocate that uh, none of them wish to speak. Uh, the defense can certainly address that, but that's what I'm informed. They certainly were offered the opportunity as is required, and I want to commend our victim advocate uh, on the excellent job she did in handling this complex situation that we wanted to be sensitive to because, again, I am not, none of us are not mindful of the fact of the suffering of this family. I know Slate Chief Mark Keel is here. Um, uh, would you like to address the court on any matters, Chief? No, sir. Uh, just to say it again, 
very proud of our agents' the work they've done. I'm proud of the partnership that we've had with the Attorney General's office as we've had for many years. And uh, again, we're here to see the justice is served, and, and we believe it has. Thank you. Thank you. For the defense. Uh, Your Honor, um, Mr. Griffin and I would have no comment. The defendant would like to address the court, though. Good morning, Your Honor. I'm innocent. I would never hurt my wife, Maggie, and I would never hurt my son, Paul. Paul. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Sit down. Yep. Anything further? I don't think further comment is necessary, Your Honor. All Thank right. you. Mr. Murdoff, you have come before the court for sentencing. This has been perhaps one of the most troubling cases, not just for me as a judge, uh, for the state, for the defense team, but for all of the citizens in this community, all the citizens in this state, and as we've seen based on the media coverage there throughout the nation, you have a wife who's been killed, murdered, a son savage, savage, savagely murdered. A lawyer, a person from a respected family who has controlled justice in this community for over a century. A person whose grandfather's portrait hang at the back of the courthouse that I had to have ordered removed in order to ensure that a fair trial was had by both the state and the defense. And I've sat through the trial, not only have it set through the trial, but also as the presiding judge of the state grand jury uh, sat through and participated in the issuance of search warrants of various sorts, bond hearings, and uh, have had to consider many things And we have this case, and I'm also assigned to preside over 99 others, at least 99 other cases. Uh, though testimony has come up regarding many of those other cases, uh, I will not make any comment with, with regard to any other pending matter, as I have been assigned those cases as well. It's also particularly troubling, uh, Mr. Murdoch, because uh, as a member of the legal community and a well-known member of the legal community, uh, you've practiced law before me, and we've seen each other at various occasions throughout the years. And it was especially heartbreaking for me to see you um, go, on, go in the media from being a, a grieving father who lost a wife and a son to being the person indicted and convicted of killing them. And you've engaged in such duplicitous conduct uh, here in the courtroom, here on the witness stand, 
and as established by the testimony throughout the time leading from the time of the indictment and prior to the indictment throughout the trial to this moment in time, uh, certainly you uh, have no obligation to say anything other than saying not guilty. <clears throat> and obviously as appeals are probably expected or absolutely expected, I would not uh, expect a confession of any kind. In fact, as I've presided over murder cases over the past 22 years, I have yet to find a defendant who could go there, who could go back to that moment in time when they decided to pull the trigger or to otherwise murder someone. I have not been able to get anyone, any defendant, even those who have confessed to being guilty, to go back and explain to me what happened at that moment in time when they opted to pull the trigger, when they opted to commit the most heinous crime known to man. In this case, qualifies under our death penalty statute based on statuto the statutory aggravating circumstances of two or more people being murdered by the defendant by one act or pursuant to one scheme or course of conduct. I don't question at all the uh, decision of the state not to pursue uh, the death penalty. But as I sit here in this courtroom and look around the many um, portraits of judges and other court officials and reflect on the fact that over the past century, your family, including you, have been prosecuting people here in this courtroom, and many have received the death penalty, probably for lesser conduct. Remind me of the expression you uh, gave on the witness stand. Was it tangled? Tangled web we weave. Uh, uh, oh, what tangled web we weave. What did you mean by that? I meant when I lied, I continue to lie. <clears throat> and the question is, when will it end? When will it end? And it, it's ended already for the jury because they've concluded that you continue to lie and lie throughout your testimony. And perhaps with all the throng of people here, they, for the most part, all believe, or 80, 90%, 99% believe that you continue to lie now when you, your statement of denial to the court. Perhaps you believe that it's, it does not matter, uh, that there's n nothing that can mitigate a sentence given the crime, the crimes that were committed. You know, a notice of alibi was filed in this case by counsel in November, and we conducted a hearing, pretrial hearing, in which you claimed to have been someplace else at the time the crime was committed. Then, after all of the witnesses placed you at the scene of the crime, at the last minute, or 
last minutes or days, you, 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 you switch courses and admit it to being there. And then that necessitated more lies and continued to lie. And, um, and I said, where will it end? It's already ended for many who have heard you and uh, concluded that it'll never end. But within your own soul, you have to deal with that. <clears throat> and I know you have to see Paul and Maggie during the night times when you're attempting to go to sleep. I'm sure they come and visit you. I'm sure. All day and every night. Yeah, I'm sure. And they will continue to do so. And, and reflect on the last time they looked you in the eyes as you looked the jury in the eyes. Um, I don't know a um, person who's always been such a gregarious, friendly person uh, and caused her life to be tangled in such a weave web such a situation that you um, yours have spun into uh, and it's so unfortunate because you had such a lovely family uh, of such friendly people and, including you and, and to go from that to this You know, your license to practice law has been stripped away from you. You turn from lawyer to witness and, and now uh, have an opportunity to make your final appeal uh, as, a, as an ex-lawyer. And it's almost, uh, it's really surprising that you're waiving this right at this time. And if you opt to do so, it, it's on you. I, you're not compelled to say anything. But you have the opportunity to do so. And I tell you again, I respect this court, but I'm innocent. I would never, under any circumstances, hurt my wife Maggie. And I would never, under any circumstances, hurt my son, Paul Paul. Well, and it might not have been you. It might have been uh, the monster you become when you uh, take 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 opioid pills. Maybe you become another person. Um, I've seen that before. The person standing before me was not the person who committed the crime, though it's the same individual. Um, we'll leave that at that. Before announcing sentence on these cases, with regard to all of the other pending cases, are any of them here in Colleton, or I'm sure some of them are? Yes, sir. Half of them, or? I, I don't have that in front of me, but there are a substantial number of charges here. There's some in Hampton, Archburg, Beaufort, uh, Allendale. Um, there may be others that I'm not thinking of right now. We might have worn out our welcome here in Colleton. Um, They have been, and I'll take this opportunity to thank Sheriff Hill and um, all of the court officials and, and really everyone I've met and, and dealt with while here in Colleton County. Just been great. But without any delay, we're going to schedule some of the other matters. Yes, I know Mr. Harputlian's scheduling is complicated, and you've sacrificed quite a bit to be able to hear, be here um, defending uh, Mr. Murdoch, as well as the Attorney General's office uh, with all the other many 
many things and obligations you have. And to be able to have the Attorney General here, um, Alan Wilson, for the period of time that he's uh, devoted to being here along with everyone else, it's, it's, it's been uh, uh, quite a sacrifice. But there are other victims whose cases deserve to be heard. And this case has jumped some of those other cases, um, perhaps jumped it because of the, in this case resulting in an, an assault on the integrity of the judicial system in our state law enforcement in our state. Even during this trial, the law enforcement have been maligned for the past five or six weeks by one who had access to, uh, to the wheels of justice to be able to deflect the investigation, and as the evidence is pointed out in this case, the looming storm that Mr. Waters talked about, I can just imagine on that day, June 7, when a lawyer is confronted and confesses to having stolen over a half a million dollars from a client and he has a tiger like Mark Tinsley on his tail pursuing discovery in the case involving the death of Mallory Beach and having a father for the most part on his deathbed. I could imagine, or really can't imagine, <laughs> I know it had to have been quite a bit uh, going through your mind on that day. But amazingly, to have you come and testify that it was just another ordinary day that my wife and son and I were out just enjoying life, not credible, not believable. You can convince yourself about it, but obviously you have the inability to convince anyone else about that. So if you made any such arguments as a lawyer, you would lose every case of that, like that. Cases you will never have an opportunity to argue anymore, except perhaps your own as you um, sit in the Department of Corrections. Anything further? No, sir. All right, Mr. Murdoch, I sentence you to the State Department of Corrections on each of the murder indictments in the murder of your wife, Maggie Murdoch. I sentence you for the term of the rest of your natural life for the murder of Paul Murdoch. whom you probably love so much, I sentence you to prison for murdering him for the rest of your natural life. Those sentences will run consecutive under the statute involving possession of a weapon during a violent crime. There is no sentence where life, a life sentence is imposed on other indictments. That is the sentence of the court, and you are remanded to the State Department of Corrections. <coughs> and officers may carry forth on the imposition.
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Before we adjourn, um, an order was issued uh, concerning maintaining the, uh, the juror's identity being anonymous. And that order was issued, and uh, for the most part, it's been complied with, uh, except for the jury leaving the courtroom yesterday, or not the jury, but the defendant leaving the courtroom while the jury is still seated. Um, protecting the identity of the jurors is certainly extremely important during the course of a trial uh, to ensure that no one makes contact with the jury or attempts to influence the jury. The jurors have a right to continue that privacy beyond their jury service, but they're not obligated to do so. And um, it would not surprise me if those, if jurors choose to come forward and to speak, and uh, they're encouraged to do so if that is their desire. I have no problem whatsoever with the jurors um, unmasking themselves uh, and speaking freely with the media because they have undergone a life-changing experience and, uh, as it relates to many of them. Uh, but, and some of them are here now, and I want them to know that should anyone attempt to harass them or annoy them, uh, please let me know and I will address the issue. Secondly, um, there's a complaint now regarding the posting of autopsy photographs or photos that came from within the, the courtroom. It's based on the direction of the, of the photographs. It did not come from the audience. It came somehow from within the well of the court. Um, the, the parties have requested an investigation of that. <laughs> um, I have my hands full doing my job, and I don't attempt to conduct any investigations beyond the conducting of a trial, um, but to the extent that law enforcement uh, decides to review that, that would be a responsibility of, of law enforcement. Yes. And... Of course, one of the reasons uh, we've sought to seal graphic photos because the parties have a right to privacy and a right to uh, those matters not being publicly disclosed. If anyone has heard about the recent settlement that Kobe Bryant's Another sports analogy, Kobe Bryant's wife just made with, the, with Los Angeles County and others out there over uh, certain disclosures of information involving the death uh, of
of Kobe Bryant, um, you know, liability can be substantial, and, and um, it, it's a risk for the most part not, that's not worth taking. Uh, so we'll let everyone judge themselves accordingly within that, with that regard. Aside from all that, our business is done here in Colleton County. And I get to use my gavel one or a few times during this trial and order that court be adjourned. Sunny die.